perfect. All right, so let me uh, work on sharing the screen here. Everybody able to see that? Yep. Yep. Doesn't go into presenter mode, unfortunately. Let's the other way. Try it this way. We just had this problem today, too. We did a, a big online meeting and nothing was working right. I feel everybody's pain. <laughs> <laughs> All the way here too. So, so tonight we're going to talk about position tolerance. So the three chapters in your book, um, 20, 21, 22, are actually all about position tolerance. Talk, you know, position tolerance is one of the more popular tolerances that you'll see uh, on drawings. Um, so it can be used in a variety of different ways. So three chapters uh, all around the same tolerance. Um, you'll understand um, why it gets used so much. Uh, but uh, taking a look at this drawing again, looking at the, the way we want to read this um, feature control frame uh, down here at the bottom is uh, position tolerance within 0 0.02 inches in relation to data A and B. So position tolerance within 0 0.02 inches to data A and data B. And you'll talk to some true hardcore um, GD&T folks that uh, before I, I learned a lot about GDT, I would call this uh, true position. And uh, true position, as we can see here, actually has a little bit of a different meaning when it comes to geometric dimensioning and tolerancing. So uh, true position is actually the theoretically exact location of the feature of size, right? So it's, it's where the hole is drilled at, the center of the hole. It's, it's theoretical. The true position is its theoretical position on the blueprint. Whereas the position tolerance is something a little bit different. That's the uh, tolerance that limits the amount of deviation of the center point axis or center plane of a feature from its actual true position. So um, again, if you pull that print up and you say true position, 99% of people or 100% of people know what you're talking about. Uh, when you read the uh, GD&T as true position of 0 0.02 inches A to B, but you'll get some GD&T snobs that'll say, no, it's not true position. It's position tolerance because of the definitions between the two. So what does a position tolerance zone look like? Um, we've got two different types of tolerance zones that we can have. Uh, one's a cylindrical tolerance zone. And if we're gonna have a cylindrical tolerance zone, what kind of modifier do we need to have on our, in our feature control frame? Anybody know? Anybody want to speak up? What was that, Francis? Sorry. Uh, diameter. The diameter symbol. So the diameter symbol is in there that our, our tolerance zone changes to a, a diameter or a cylinder. Uh, if our feature is a planar feature, then our tolerance zone becomes a parallel tolerance between two planes. Uh, so we'll, we'll be able to talk about that a little bit more when we open up SolidWorks and talk through some of the drawings as well. So when can a position tolerance be used? It must be applied to a feature of size or a pattern of feature of sizes. So that's pretty interesting. So we talked, here's one of our first classes, we talked about um, the uh, studs or the lug nuts on a, on a car wheel. Um, you can apply a positional tolerance to that pattern of grouping uh, to tolerance the location of all of those holes. Basic dimensions must be used to define the position of the tolerance feature the size, which again, as we get to the drawings, we'll, we'll see, but uh, uh, we'll, uh, so Carl just got here. Uh, we'll, we'll, talk, we'll talk more about the use of basic dimensions. Uh, datum references must be specified in the feature control frame. And if 
a modifier of maximum material condition, the least material condition is, is not used, regardless of feature size, is the default condition. So what kind of modifiers can be used? So just like Francis said, um, the diameter symbol, uh, the release through straight requirement, the projection tolerance zone can be used as well too. The projection tolerance zone, uh, what it does is it can uh, ask you to project that geometrical tolerance past the features of the part. So if you were gonna position a, a screw up pin into a part or, or press a pin into a part and at the end of the pin we needed to have uh, that true the position back again then uh, that's where uh, the projection tolerance comes in not used as much it's a little harder to inspect so there's typically features uh, you know control the G D and T uh, between the two different components um, and uh, rather than use the projection phase or projection modifier, I'm sorry. Statistical process control, again, can be put on there, but typically noted somewhere else on an uh, inspection requirement or on a inspection report or in a note somewhere on the print. I'm missing, oh, we have two of the same page here. What's going on? So the other ones that'll be used is maximum material condition and least material condition. So it looks like my copy and pasting of slides, I copy and pasted the same slide over the top of each other. So. Uh, more to add on here, maximum material condition, the least material condition uh, can also be used as a modifier. So how do we interpret those position tolerances? So it's either an axis or a center plane, tolerance zone. Um, let's not we'll worry about the virtual condition boundary. Position tolerance applies it regardless of feature size. Um, and position tolerance also applies at maximum material condition or least material condition. We're going to run through some examples tonight, so it's going to make it uh, a lot more real. Um, where position tolerance applies it, regardless of feature size, we can use an axis. Uh, axis to the unrelated actual mating envelope must be located within a tolerance zone. Kind of overkill. Uh, one of the big ones, those orientations controlled relative to the primary date of reference. So we'll, we'll talk that through as we look at our interpretation tonight. So what are the advantages of using uh, a tolerance or a position tolerance zone? Uh, is, uh, it actually provides a 57% larger tolerance zone than um, using a standard plus or minus uh, tolerance zone. So uh, permits bonus and datum shift, uh, which is huge when it comes to the assembly pieces. Uh, we just ran into a, a, a situation today where somebody came to me with a, a GD&T that uh, the customer did not believe checked as it was supposed to because it checked actually as zero, checked perfect. And they said, ah, I don't think you really checked that. What's it supposed to check or what's it really checking? Um, and it had both bonus and a datum shift on it. The datum shift allowed us to move the OD of the part around to bring the center line on, on um, in line with the theoretical center line. So it, because they gave us that datum shift, it was uh, um, a zero. Uh, positional tolerance. Um, positional tolerances prevent tolerance accumulation or tolerance stack up. Um, we see that quite a bit. Um, we can talk that through uh, in our example tonight, but uh, if you're designing a block or manufacturing a block that's got multiple holes in it and somebody or dimensions the part from one edge to the first hole and then from the next hole, from that hole to the next hole, from that hole to the next hole, what ends up happening is if you have a plus or minus 5,000 tolerance on each one of those um, length tolerances, by the time you get to the end, you might hit, you might be 15,000 out of spec. Um, it checks good as far as what the drawing was, uh, how the drawing was created, but from a functionality standpoint, the last hole is now so far out of location that it won't uh, assemble properly. Position tolerances are pretty nice because you can build functional gauges and check them uh, relatively easily for uh, production components. Uh, positional tolerances protect part function that truly does lower manufacturing and inspection costs. So I'm going to switch over to my whiteboard and I want to talk about how does it 
provide a 57% larger tolerance zone than a standard plus or minus tolerance does. So a second to get that moving here. So I think everybody can see the whiteboard now, right? Yeah. Yeah. So if we take a look at, um, I'll draw a relatively large circle there, Paul. Let's say that uh, that's a blown up view of a, of a hole in a part. There's going to be a tolerance that comes from the edge of the part. Let's just call it one inch plus or minus 0 0.01 inches from the uh, center line of the hole. What we end up having is a tolerance zone that looks like this. That's a square. And that square becomes 20 thousandths this way, probably 20 thousandths that way too. So if I was to draw a dimension that came from here to the bottom of the part, you said it was the same type of tolerance. Uh, we'd have a, a box tolerance zone that, that looks like such. But the challenge is, is in your mating part probably has the same tolerance zone, but if somebody were to put the center line over here on, on the uh, component we're making and, and the other vendor who's making the mating part had something happen and all the parts were center line in this location, there's there's a pretty good chance that the, uh, the tolerance stack up between the locations, the, the mating part and everything, uh, we're going to run into uh, an assembly issue. If you were to dimension this so that we eliminate the plus or minus tolerance zones on there, we make these dimensions basic, And then we put a call out on here that says that the positional tolerance is within a diameter of 0 0.02, the datum A, datum B. Actually, I can't do 0 0.02. Scratch that. It's going to be bigger. I would do some calculation. I'd figure out the hypotenuse of the triangle out here, but uh, oh, it would be 0 0.02. Never mind. Going out to uh, the corners there, um, we now have all this additional zone given to us that will still allow the part to be assembled together. Does that make sense? I think I spoke on a term when I did the green dot and the yellow dot saying that they would not assemble together. They could still possibly assemble together. Um, but we've now opened the tolerance zone up to a 20 thousandths diameter circle. So we get all this extra space inside here. Is that additional 57% of tolerance zone that we did not have before. And that's by having the call out, the positional call out? By having a positional call out rather than having a plus or minus call out. So the plus or minus call out is going to make it tighter? Yeah, the plus or minus call out does make it tighter. Because the, the plus or minus call out is represented by the blue box, it's plus or minus 10 thousandths. We did a diameter of 0 0.02 thousandths of 20 thousandths, and the circle that diameter touches the corners of that box. It still gives us all that additional zone around the outside of the box as a as a, within tolerance at this point. So the way it works out from areas of a circle versus area of a square um, becomes 57 percent greater with the area of the circle. That's where 
that you start to talk about it lowers your manufacturing and inspection costs on there. So it gives you a little bit more wiggle room as far as what your uh, tolerance zone is to, you know, most people go into it saying there's no way GDT, I need a CMM, I got to go out and buy uh, 40,000, 140,000, 1.4 million dollar depending on the size of the part you make CMM in order to inspect these parts. But um, that's not always the case. Uh, you, you can check positional tolerance with uh, functional gauges as well. Um, you can do it with a height gauge too. Yeah. It, it really becomes just a, uh, um, a mathematical function to get the position of the tolerance relative to the uh, theoretical center line. So that's where the 57% the comes in. Um, so it, it's, it's pretty unique. The whole assembly has got to be designed that way to maximize all that space. Um, but with the same number, uh, we get to have a larger diameter or larger tolerance zone on there too. And the beautiful thing is too, is if I didn't put a hole size on this, but let's, let's call that hole as a half of an inch in diameter, plus or minus 15 thousandths. If I was to modify the, uh, oops, just erase that. If I was to modify the uh, call out to be 20 thousandths at maximum material condition, I now have bonus tolerance that I'm able to use too. And the way that I like to calculate bonus out is we look at, we'll draw a little chart. We look at the diameter of, of the part, and then we look at the positional tolerance over in this chart. If we start off at maximum material condition, MMC. What is maximum material condition? If this is a hole, this area right here is a hole, so this is all getting drilled out. So maximum material condition of that 0.5 plus or minus 15 would be what? The takers? 4.85. 485. So maximum material conditions when the part weighs its most. So 0.485. And at 0.485 at maximum material condition, that's when we apply 0 0.02 for our tolerance zone. Right? So you're, now, getting, you're right, getting additional two, uh, two thousandths on top of the 485? No, the two, the 0.2. 0.02 20 thousandths is my total tolerance at when the hole is at 0.485 inches. Okay. Right. Now, what's least material condition? 515. 0.515. What's the difference between 485 and 515? 30. 30 thousandths. So add your 30 thousandths. Now I have a 50 thousandths tolerance, positional tolerance. So I have my base of 20, plus I get bonus of 30 because the hole grew in size based on where I held my tolerance zone at, and we get a greater tolerance at that point. So basically what they're saying from an assembly standpoint is this is a hole, something's got to fit inside this hole, right? A pin or something else. If that hole is at its smallest size, it's probably going to be pretty close to the size of the pin. I got to be pretty, pretty close to being on center at that point. But the bigger that the hole grows, and that if the pin is still at 485, I have a more room that I can be off center, and that pin's still going to fit within that hole. So for every piece of growth that we get on that hole size we get additional wiggle room in our positional tolerance all the way down to that 50 thousandths when we're at our largest size or least material condition. I never bothered with a chart. I always just used the formula. Yeah, <laughs> I, I had to come up with a visual way to show it to everybody like that, so. Um, but 
again, if we went with standard plus or minus 10 thousands, you're plus or minus 10 thousands every single time you put that hole in there. So you don't get any bonus at all on there. So um, what's wonderful about it is if you run into an issue where, um, let's say for whatever reason, somebody drills a hole off center a little bit and under the plus or minus 10 thousands standard tolerancing, that part would have been scrapped. With gd &T, you might be able to, to do something a different manufacturing process to open that hole up closer to its least material condition size and you'll be with intolerance just because you open the hole up even though it's off center at that point so um, maybe broach it or something yeah what's that francis uh there's a process called broaching where you can very precisely enlarge a hole so there's just options, but again, if the standard tolerancing that we're used to, plus or minus, does not afford us the additional 57% tolerance zone, plus the bonus tolerance that we're able to get on, on the part. So from a manufacturing perspective, you can really lower your cost to manufacture that part if you approach it the right way. Anybody have any questions on this before I close it out? Move on. Right. Go back to the uh, PowerPoints. <clears throat> so, feature of size relationships controlled by position. So, these are the types of Side, these are the type of dimensions that are typically controlled by a positional tolerance. So uh, spacing between features of size, location of a pattern or an individual feature of size, uh, coaxiality between features of size, and symmetrical relationships between features of size. So um, what we basically saw was, in my example I just did on the whiteboard, would have been location of an individual feature of size or the second bullet point down there too. Um, from a, what they talk about coaxiality, I'll share um, whiteboard again. For the coaxiality between features of size, uh, we just seen one of these today at work is if you had a, uh, a round part, it would typically be turned in a lathe. It's got an outside diameter and an inside diameter. The part looks Something like this. Draw the hidden lines in there. And see a call out that says that the uh, outside diameter, let's call it one inch, uh, plus or minus ten thousandths. We'll call that data A. You can turn around and, and use positional tolerance. To say I want the I the inside diameter. Let me let me backtrack this here for a second. Let's call the inside diameter is 0.75 three quarters of an inch, plus or minus ten thousandths. Then we're going to attach some GD and T to it. I don't want to change the colors. So. We'll say that positional tolerance. Positional tolerance within five thousandths diameter relative to data A. So, just like our hole in our previous operation had a center line, we have a center line here as well. And this tolerance zone, because of the positional tolerance, states that the inside diameter of the part the entire center line for that inside diameter all the way down has to fit within the cylinder diameter of 0 0.005 inches uh, for the length of the part. So is 
an interesting way to do it. Um, you can call it out as um, runouts. There's a bunch of different ways that you can go about and define what we're defining here with positional tolerance. Um, but it, it is a way uh, to call out for the, uh, the coaxiality between features and size. So what they're saying is they want um, the inside diameter to basically say be concentric to the outside diameter with a five thousandths diameter circle or cylinder. And then finally, I'll, let me erase this one too. We'll talk about the fourth bullet point, which was symmetrical relationship between features of size. Erase all that. Everything we've done up to this point has been round features. Uh, but let's say that we have a part Let me restart this. So I'll show this on a different view. That part looks like this, and then from the top view, it basically has a slot that runs directly through the uh, center of the part right there. As this part could be dimensioned, we'll look at it and we could say that uh, the width of the dimension, I'm going to use my awesome one inch, DPB is one inch, plus or minus 15 thousandths for the width of the slot. The uh, distance from the edge here, we'll call this 1.5, so we we'll keep using the same numbers. But we're going to call this bottom face. Theta A. Then on this slot itself, we're going to put a positional tolerance 0 0.005 in relationship to data A. If you notice, we are not using the diameter symbol, no modifier for this positional tolerance. Just like <clears throat> the um, previous examples, the slot itself has a theoretical center line about it. It says center line runs, um, it, the center line is the, uh, the center between the two faces of the uh, the slot itself. So what we're asking for now, when we say a positional tolerance within 0 0.005 in relationship to data A, is that center line or center plane has to fall within two planes that are five thousandths apart from each other in relationship to the theoretical center line or true position center line of that slot. Any questions on that? But uh, if you notice, there starts to become a pattern. There's only two types of tolerance zones that we typically see, and they're either cylindrical or they're planar parallel two parallel planes or the diameter of a cylinder. I uh, get to be used for everything just about that we've worked up to at this point. Profile changes it a little bit. Um, that's why we saved that for last. But for the most part, all everything that we've learned so far uses the same type of tolerance zones. All right. Not sharing this one. Back to the uh, screen, the PowerPoint. All right, that's actually it for tonight on the PowerPoint. I do want to go over some, uh, want to go over a, a drawing that I put together for a different PowerPoint. It makes it easier to present it this way.
can everybody see the uh, screen that I'm sharing right now? Yep. Um, so we've got two drawings here. Uh, one I call the receiving block, one that we call the penetrating block. And if you notice, um, they look similar, right? So that left view or the top view, the part, the parts almost look identical, but when you get to the right side view, we can see that uh, the penetrating block's got three bosses that stick out, out of it, whereas the uh, penetrating block has got three holes inside of it, too. Um, I'm going to kind of give you a 3D representation of the... Uh, 3D representation of the uh, assembly itself. So everybody can see the SOLIDWORKS screen. So these are the two parts sitting in a 3D world here. And I just had drawn something relatively quick that would showcase in this assembly. So it's nothing too uh, fancy here. But uh, in essence, what we're looking to do is we're looking to uh, assemble these so that this hole and that hole line up with each other. The other pins will also go in. So I'm going to pick. other features here. And in theory, that part should fit together seamless like that. The pins mount inside the, uh, the holes, the two faces touch together, and the part should assemble without a problem. problem we end up having is depending on how we sorry I'm trying to how we dimension that tolerance it um, the people manufacturing it unless you're manufacturing it in your own plant probably have no idea that these two parts go together. They might not even be manufacturing it in their same plant from a vendor standpoint. We might have uh, vendor A manufacturing this component because they were a little cheaper than vendor B. And then vendor C has always manufactured this one. So we, we, we leave it with vendor C. So they, they never get a chance to fit these two things together in their plants before they ship it to you, the customer, uh, to make sure that everything assembles properly. Uh, I, I always tell everybody, uh, you're, you get the, a, a really good opportunity to see how good your blueprints are when you let somebody else make your parts for you. Um, if you're making them in-house and there's a lot of tribal knowledge that happens in the manufacturing plant, we well, can get away with a lot. But then the minute that the person with the tribal knowledge leaves or you have to outsource that component for whatever reason, if the blueprint is not right, you're not going to get what you expect for the part. So tolerancing them properly uh, becomes important. That's where some of the GD&T comes into play as well. Um, and then if you're on, just on the manufacturing side, you're not actually the design engineer, manufacturing them properly is also uh, very important too. So understanding the gd &T, uh, and and making sure it's being used properly is important. Tim, how often does that happen? Uh, you'd be, uh, it happens an absolute lot. You'd okay. be surprised. So um, where we, uh, if you talk to um, a handful of design engineers and you'll ask them why they put a certain tolerance on a component. Um, they said, well, I figure that's what you could hold. It's not what needed. It's just what they figured you could hold from a tolerancing standpoint. So um, it, it takes a lot of work to go through a full assembly and make sure that it assembles together. Um, think of a car engine. There's thousands of components that go into a car engine. And if somebody has to go through and do an analysis on all those parts because there's there's multiple factories all over the world that use metric standards inches that have different measuring tools that need to be calibrated some are measuring them with micrometers some are measuring them with cmms um, so there's got to be definite standards that are put into place um, to check those tolerances to say this is what i need to have so that i can allow the actual manufacturing plant 
uh, to have some variation in their process, acceptable variation within their process. Um, so there's firms out there, a lot of them unfortunately are in um, Asia and things where they will do tolerance stack-up analysis on full assemblies of parts and uh, help you address your concerns. Um, some of the uh, uh, companies that do that too, they're not always the best at it either, so they just slap some tolerances on the parts just to, to, to try and hold, itself, hold, hold you accountable. But uh, it happens an absolute time. We spend a lot of our time when we do launches here um, analyzing tolerances on components. Can we hold them? Can we measure to them? Um, and then working with the customer to find out what they actually need. Uh, let's uh, pop back into the uh, prints here. Everybody's able to see the two prints. You saw kind of the assembly, what it looks like. So if we were to look at these two prints, um, based on what we've gone over the past few weeks, um, if, I'm, if, if I'm giving you Google map directions, what's the first thing I'm asking? Or if, I'm, if you call me up and say, how do I get to your house? What's the first thing I'm asking? Where are you coming from? Where are we coming from, right? So what are we looking for? What's the first thing we're looking for in these prints? Datum. Datums, right? Datum A. So we're looking at datums, and is it? And we're right now we're looking at it from the design engineer perspective. Okay, so we imagine ourselves right now. We, we've gotten a call from our quality department. Um, we're the design engineering group. We've got a call from the, the quality department saying, "Hey, you know, Houston, we've got a problem. We've got a thousand of each one of these parts sitting out here, and about half of them won't go together with each other." So either you come down here and figure out our match sets and, and, and make them right, or I think we need to possibly update our prints or we need to tell the vendors the parts were wrong. So as an engineering group, we're gonna come back and we're gonna address these, these quality concerns by looking at first at what the prints, if the prints are correct or not, based on the parts fitting together. So let's look at our datum structure. And um, so on the, uh, the receiving block side, we've got datum A being on the, uh, the top, um, datum B on the right side of the print, over here, datum C on the back side over here. Uh, we've got three holes in the part, right? It's just three times, half of an inch, 0. 0.500 plus or minus two, position within 0. 0.005 and maximum material condition to A, B, and C. So the first thing we want to double check is anytime we have a positional tolerance for holes or anything really, we need to make sure that all of our locating dimensions are basic. Checks off, it looks good, right? So those are basic on there. Uh, we have an overall length of the part of four inches and we've got an overall height of three inches. So off the bat, right? Nothing too concerning. Uh, one thing I would see here is, is uh, we're, we're probably missing the diameter modifier. So we'd wanna, because it's a, a round feature, we're measuring off an axis, we wanna make sure that we are specifying that tolerance zone is uh, diametrical instead of um, planar. Let's go over and take a look at the mating part. So this part has to mate up with this component here. So let's take a look. Let's look at our datums. The, the um, datums in the wrong place. Right, we, we probably want our datums to match up because they're gonna be primary, secondary, and tertiary. So great find, Dave. Um, so what I mean by primary, secondary, and tertiary is that um, when I mount this part into an inspection fixture or into the assembly itself, based on the three, two, one rule, I need three points of contact on this face. I need two points of contact on this face, and I need a single point of contact for datum C, which means that this face is, 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 is going to basically do the majority of the aligning on the part. Whereas if we go back to our original one, the top face is going to be our face that does the majority of aligning. So um, we know, based on what we learned, that this is an applied 90 degree angle. Somewhere on here, I don't have the tolerances listed because I went through this relatively quick. 
let's say it's plus or minus one degree, there could be a nice angle on this face that throws off these dimensions. Um, that, especially when we're locating off of it, that we're not seeing on this one either. So first thing right off the bat, we probably need to restructure our datums. Um, datum A should be matched the same face and this print datum B should match the same side. Datum C, if we take a look, we've got datum. So this face right here needs to basically, oh, never mind, I do have it the right way. So datum C is on the right face. It's the proper face on this one. This face is going to, to mount up to this face here. So datum A and B are incorrect on there. Uh, let's take a look at tolerances. Um, since data A and B are different, we're coming off of different faces here, right? And we're saying that this dimension right here is three quarters of an inch from this face over. We want to take a look at how that goes for this hole. Wait a minute, there's no, there's no dimension on that face. It's coming off the other face. That's a problem. So on the receiving block, we've taken all our dimensions off of data B. We've got our datum set up incorrectly. We're, we're taking them off a of datum. So, if two different engineers had made these in a vacuum from each other, the datum structure might seem okay, and the tolerance and the dimension from the datum structure looks okay. Uh, we've got our hole three times 0.500 plus or minus two thousandths. Positional tolerance within ten thousandths to A, B, and C. So, over here, we've got five. Over here we got 10, uh, it's not gonna work, right? So we, we would need to clean that up as well too. We'd want these G, T and Ds to match up or one of them to be tighter than the other so that we ensure that the parts are going to mate up. But the uh, part on, the, are, you, are, we into, are we saying that the part on the left was the part we made first and the part on the right is the part that the other organization or whatever made second, maybe? Sure, absolutely. So at some point when you're doing a comparison, right, you have to say, uh, I'm gonna use example A as what I wanna compare example B to. So we're gonna say example A, if the datum structure is correct on example A, we're gonna use that as the basis. Um, we have uh, some minor issues with some GD&T call outs on here. Um, but we want to compare example B or the penetrating block. So yeah, I guess, you know, Dave, sorry for not being more clear on that, but um, so. Well, it actually looks like they were designed by the same facility. It just that they were different design engineers and the one guy on the right there needs to go back to school. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so we're, we're also missing so what ends up happening when you have the GD&T on this hole size, right? So even though it's incorrect, we have GD&T controlling all three hole locations, but we also now have a positional tolerance of plus or minus five thousandths on here. These two tolerances are competing against each other. And as a manufacturer, you don't know which one they're looking for. Um, so you have to clarify We've had to do this multiple times as well too. It might, if we're the manufacturer and we catch this, this would be, I would have to make a phone call back to the customer and say, which one do you want? Is this hole not included in this three, three times pattern? Um, if it is, we need to eliminate the plus or minus five thousandths and it needs to become a basic tolerance so the gd and can control that hole location. Uh, if it's not, then you need to make this a two times call out and put a separate hole call out on this one too. But um, probably not. So we're gonna, we would need to scratch this off and make this basic as well. Anything else that I'm missing on here? Find the line of appearance on the two sizes of the holes and the bosses. Very probably. You could make that hole as small as the tolerance allows and the boss as big as the tolerance allows. And you ain't gonna never put those things together. Exactly. So something interesting. So when you're in gd &T class and, and uh, this would be something to keep in mind for the final project is you're 
uh, need to look at it from a quality perspective too, right? Um, so we're looking at everything and it's easy to overlook all the other dimensions and focus purely on this feature control frame because that's what the class is about. But uh, what Francis is saying is we can make this pin 0 0.502 inches and we can make this hole 0.498. Uh, it's not, it's not going to go together. Right, so that's that's another miss too. That's that's a tolerance stack up issue uh, for an assembly standpoint. That um, you know we only have to worry about basically a few different features on a part. And, but that's what these um, drafters and, and other people go through in order to recognize that those those stack ups. So good eyes, Francis. Lots of practice. <laughs> That's what it takes, right? Carefully look at it, take your time, work together as a team. It's always important, right? Because uh, you might be able to catch all of it, but it's it's always good to have somebody double check your work when you look at these things. Too. Let's take a look at what my finish would look like and see if we got it right. See if we made it any better. So now here we've got the two engineers together. We've collaborated and uh, we've updated the blueprints to be a lot more controlled to ensure that assembly would happen on the part. So let's take a look at the first thing that Francis pointed out. So here's the hole, 501 plus 0 .001. And if we take a look now at the pin, it's 500 plus zero minus two. So at its highest limit, 500, it will still fit into the part even when this is at its lowest limit over here as well too. Um, we've changed up the, the datum structures to match. So actually what we did today, we did opposite of what you said. We, we took the, uh, this and left this datum structure in place and changed the uh, receiving block datum structure. But now all the holes, the datum structure matches up. They're coming off of the same Not face. entirely. It looks like the uh, new datum C is on the top of the pin rather than on the plot. It's true. Nope. I don't remember why I changed it like that. Um, don't remember, Francis, why I did that. <laughs> We've got our It makes sense. That's your introduction to the mating of the part. That's the first interface. You know what I was thinking this thing of like is a, is a die and a punch set. So, so if that's the case, we want those datums, you know, because it's going to do a cutting action if you put a piece of material between there. That, that's where where my thought process was. Apologize if you can hear the phone ringing in the background. I'm out in the shop office still. So, um, positional tolerances match up. And one thing we did add on here too is we said, hey, we, we also want to make sure that these holes are ground as well. Because uh, if we if we're out of round, uh, we're going to run into an issue where they won't assemble together either. Apologize, the phone will keep ringing until somebody picks it up. If you guys can hear that or not. Oh yeah, we can hear it. <laughs> I apologize. Typically, if I was in a meeting, this is when I put myself on mute and let uh, everybody else do the talking. I don't even know how to answer outside calls. Um, super distracting. That's why I typically like to get a conference room, but uh, run into technical issues with conference room. So what I did not do is there, there would be some calculations behind the positional tolerance to make sure that it is accurate with these tolerances as well too. I didn't go through all that math when I did this. Um, we just matched them up to say, um, based on the hole size tolerancing and the pin size tolerancing, if the positional tolerances are held the same, these parts should fit together. So pretty rudimentary way to go about it, but for, for this application, it, it, it works uh, as well. Um, again, knowing, I call it, I, I could have called this a punch and a die rather than a penetrating block or a receiving block, but uh, I don't know if anybody's ever seen one of those before, but you slide a piece of material between them. Um, 
a slide the two components together and then when you use a press or something like that you'll punch the three holes into the uh, piece of material that is uh, being uh, manufactured using the punch and die set so that's why on the back side of this face here we put a parallelism call out of 1000 to the front face is because if whatever we use, a hydraulic press or something along those lines makes contact with that back face, if it's angled, it may uh, take the rest of the assembly and push it out of direction at that point, too. So Same that's why you didn't put a parallelism on that other face that the bosses were coming out of. Right here, exactly, because chances are they'll make contact with each other, but at that point in time, everything's being located, the fans and the whole monitor, too. And I, same thing here, right? We put um, a we, or we put a flatness tolerance on this face to part on datum C. That's going to be where the pins themselves actually make contact with the part. And from a uh, design standpoint, that's where the shearing of the material is actually going to happen too. If that's not flat, you're going to end up with a rough sheared edge on the part. Um, so same thing here, we put the flatness tolerance on, on this as well, on the pins. Uh, that for the same reason we have a parallelism tolerance on the, uh, the punch, we put a parallelism tolerance on the back side of the pin so that when it makes contact with the two faces, it's not going to skew or anything like that. But that's the importance of making tolerance incorrect because if you don't make tolerance incorrect, we have a, a significant chance that these parts are not going to fit together. Uh, they cannot fit together and the, each one of the vendors will have made them per print, per spec, but we're now stuck paying for parts that we can't use. And you're going to have to eat the tooling change cost. <laughs> That's right, depending on what it is. So Grant's is referring to a feature made out of plastic or something and uh, then you're you're going to make new molds and you're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars could be if, if depending on, on what the uh, component is so um, as parts get bigger assemblies get uh, a little bit more complicated uh, chances of this impacting your bottom line and being incorrect continue to grow uh, could you imagine working at caterpillar and then the, during final assembly when you finally go to put the cab on top of the tractor and the holes don't line up, uh, it's not going to be a good day if you have a bunch of cabs waiting to be put on and the holes aren't correct in the body of the chassis to put those on there. So um, tolerancing is significantly important. It's important to understand it in the design phase. It's important to understand it in the manufacturing phase. And it's very important to understand it in the inspection phase. Any questions at all? Everybody's still awake, so that's good. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm going to make these drawings available on Canvas so that uh, people can take a look at what the pre look, the pre uh, change looks like and the post change looks like uh, as well. Um, I'm more than happy to share solid models with anybody that wants to, to to play with those if you have the ability. I don't know if you have modeling software. And speak on that if, if nobody does uh, there's a free software online called on shape that if you're interested in doing some solid modeling and don't have access to SolidWorks or, or another paid software uh, on shape is really good and you don't need a supercomputer you can do it from a Chromebook or anything too because uh, it's all online based uh, to, to do assembly models and drawings and everything too. Shape, Tim on shape on shape o n s h a p e hope they're calling back again sorry <laughs> um with that i'm going to stop recording right now um